I'm really pleased to be talking to Paul Verkeil. Uh, he is a very distinguished um, expert in administrative law. Uh, I believe your last formal job was as uh, chairman of the uh, Administrative Conference of the United States, which is the body that uh, represents uh, the, what is it, the chief legal counsels in a, agencies throughout the federal government? Yes, it does, more or less. It also represents all the agencies, especially the independent agencies, mm -hmm. uh, in trying to coordinate their work. And it, its mission, it's called a conference mm -hmm. because its mission is to issue recommendations to improve government performance. Right. And uh, <laughs> before that, uh, you were an academic, you were a dean of a couple of different law schools, uh, a professor of administrative law. Uh, and uh, we've been working together uh, to deal with the, you know, what I think we see as the threats to the American civil service uh, that are posed by things like Project 2025 if uh, the Republicans uh, win the election in November. And so hopefully we will be able to talk about all of those uh, issues. So let's just begin. Uh, we have this thing called the administrative state. Actually, people on the left tend not to think about that, but conservatives are really preoccupied with this. And uh, in the Trump administration, this came to be known as the deep state, not just the administrative state, which had all of these sinister connotations. You know, the deep state really originated in places like Turkey and Egypt, where you had a military and national security establishment that were actually pulling strings behind people's backs. Uh, and Many conservatives would like to have us believe that we have a similar kind of deep state operating in the United States that is conspiring to take away the rights of, you know, ordinary Americans. Uh, and uh, I think both of us believe that this is a really false, uh, false narrative. Um, so maybe we could just, and well, uh, we we have in front of us a couple of initiatives again coming from the right that in a way attack the administrative state uh, frontally. We have this Project 2025 where you would basically turn all federal civil servants into at will people that could be fired and replaced by political partisans. And then you have a Supreme Court, a conservative Supreme Court that's issued a number of rather controversial decisions, including the recent Loper Bright one that eliminates uh, you know, uh, Chevron deference. What that is, we will explain, you know, shortly. But so, Paul, maybe you just want to talk about this general context and, uh, you know, what what the complaint about the administrative state has been and, and what's wrong with that critique. Yes, Frank, thank you. <coughs> and uh, but I should say, I'm so glad you're interested in the subject because <laughs> you have such a wide range and deep scholarship and knowledge about the world in general. And, and I'm glad you're focusing on this. I do think the administrative state and its future are really a fundamental question for American uh, American life and pr political life in particular. Um, the My interests really, um, I've been an administrative law professor for a long time. I you know, wrote treatises and all of about these things and, and did work that I felt was important about administrative law. But I, dawned on me later in life that administrative law is not the full picture at all. It's really um, more about public administration and about administrative policy making and how it's done. And the law really has not much of a role to play uh, except at the very end of this day phase. And so I got interested in, in government policy. That's why my five years as chairman of the administrative conference were so important an organization that I'd worked with for many years as, as a consultant and uh, saw the good work it did. And in fact, much of my scholarship emerged from topics at an um, administrative uh, conference called ACUS, A-C-U-S, uh, had generated. So now we're looking at, I think, a departure point in the administrative state, which is as dramatic as anything we have seen post the federal uh, regime that began with uh, President Roosevelt, FDR. 
In fact, my theme today, which in chatting with you, is going to be the Back to the Future. Mm -hmm. um, it looks to me like a lot that's going on, especially in the Supreme Court, is rem reminiscent of what happened to the court in the 1930s. Uh, let's shall we talk yeah, about please, Chevron, please? Um, as we know, th this um, because or, or maybe just to fill in a little bit uh, for people that don't follow this obsessively, the administrative state really blossomed and grew in size during the New Deal. During yes, Franklin Roosevelt's I mean that's New why Deal. it's so important to mm -hmm. look at that period because before that, you know, it was a limited state. Although the Progressive Era, there were obviously things that went on, but we didn't start regulating in a great uh, way, broadly, until Roosevelt, until things like, you know, the, the National Recovery Act, and there, um, there was even a, a drive to uh, regulate the economy and set prices and all kinds of things that way beyond what we had done in the past. And of course, the, the, the then court uh, reacted strongly to that kind of thing, um, and we know the cases going back um, uh, they started with non-delegation, protecting against Congress giving away its power to the agencies, and, and President Roosevelt himself was quite frustrated by, by the court's behavior, and it took a while before it finally agreed to up uphold some of the important uh, legislation that was passed. To the point where he actually tried to pack the court with more sympathetic uh, justices. Yes, you know, and, and it's reminiscent, packing the court, you know, uh, didn't succeed, of course, and, and that's probably a good thing. Um, but um, it did succeed in one sense because it got the court to switch. That's the famous switch in time that saved nine um, when Justice Owen Roberts uh, came out on the side of the of approving uh, administrative state issues. Um, so it had some effect in that way. Uh, and I, it, it makes me think, you know, today when we're talking about not court packing exactly, but changing the standards, and even President Biden has said we're, we maybe we should, um, you know, have a constitutional amendment to limit the time of court appointments and so forth. There's a little bit of that tension in the air again. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it'll have the same impact on the judges. i uh, rather doubt that. Uh, but there it is. Uh, so we were, the New Deal has always been the bete noir of, I guess, used to be thought the conservatives, but now it's very, very much the end of, they see it as the end of the world. It, it was never seen that way. Um, Chevron is such a good example. This case was decided 40 years ago. It's, by the way, this court, talk about respect for precedent, and that's a 40-year precedent I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about a second case, Jarkazi, which is like a 90-year precedent. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But these, and of course, you know, if you go back to Dobbs, Roe was a 50-year precedent. So this court is not shy about redoing things. And that's why when I say this is a 1930s court, I, I, I really think they believe that mm -hmm. without saying so themselves. Um, so what happened at Chevron? Chevron, look, I've taught Chevron. All my colleagues still teaching administrative law are revising their case books because the half of administrative law is about Chevron mm -hmm. as a practical matter and its implications. So it, it, everyone is hard at work. You can only imagine uh, this, with uh, classes opening soon how, how many cases have to be put in and changed. Um, but Chevron was simply... a it's a judge-made rule. It's a court-made rule. It's not a statute, but it says simply that when there's two steps, and if in terms of statutory analysis, the court will step in in step one if it's clear what the meaning of a statute is, and the administrative agency has no role in that. But at step two, if the statute is ambiguous, then the court will say, look, let's listen to the agency. And indeed, it goes further than that. It says there is an implied delegation to the agency by Congress when a statute is ambiguous, a statute that Congress is obviously written, that we ought to let the agency's voice be heard. And even, even if the court disagrees, as long as it's reasonable, it should defer to the agency. That was the rule. The rule was set up, involved EPA, um, and it was set up 
I, I think ultimately uh, by um, Justice Stevens, it was actually a liberal's gift to the conservatives back in the day, uh, which is sometimes forgotten because Justice Stevens said, look, let's, let's not fight about every time someone comes up. If the Reagan administration wants to change the rules, um, we're going to defer. And he, he cited a, a case uh, by Justice Rehnquist to show that, you know, a change in administration should be a change in policy. So that was how it started. And it didn't have all this encrusted meaning at the time, but it became so powerful that it's the most cited case in, in the Supreme Court uh, in the Ministry of Law. Maybe in everything. I, I haven't done all that, but I maybe Marbury runs Marbury versus Madison might beat it out. But um, so then comes along. It's been a lot of criticism about it because this presumed intent of Congress uh, has rankled some of the judges and this implied delegation. So it finally came to a head. Now it was it wasn't enforced very much. It, it, the Supreme Court hadn't cited it since 2016. Uh, even the lower courts were certainly um, still using it. So finally the court said, let's put it to bed, let's put it to rest. Um, and they came up with this Loper Bright, L-O-P-E-R Bright. Uh, the name of a fishing company. Yes. Right. The name of a fishing company which objected to paying for fees to inspect itself. Um, it, it was a, an adjudication by government or rule. So the case comes up and the Supreme Court uses this opportunity to say, let's get rid of this rule. It's a terrible rule. It violates several things. First, the Administrative Procedure Act, <clears throat> Section 706 says, the court shall decide all legal questions. <clears throat> and secondly, more deeply, Marbury versus Madison said, it's the duty of the courts uh, to tell what the law is. But we knew all of that. Chevron knew all of that. So, but they're just bringing this out, and so they're making a big deal about it. And uh, as a result, I, I wonder where we're going to go. Um, it's it's interesting what happens when you don't have Chevron deference. Uh, one problem, of course, is the courts can't decide all legal questions or all questions before the agency if they want to get overwhelmed and have everything done, uh, as you say, a de novo, quote, de novo review of everything the administrative agency does in court, mm -hmm. you know, this would be unworkable even as a system. So they have to <coughs> use some kind of deference. And uh, what, what they are now back to is a case decided well before um, Chevron, indeed, before the Administrative Procedure Act, which was created in 1940. In 1944, there's a case called Skidmore versus Swift um, that is now the rule of the law. And that's a Justice Jackson, Robert Jackson opinion, fascinating opinion, where he said, look, the agency should get the, the support it deserves based on whether we're persuaded, persuaded by its reasoning. Um, and if you're persuaded by the agency's reasoning, then you should defer. And so that is technically the rule. That's, that's what uh, Chief Justice Roberts said as much. Uh, so Skidmore deference, quote unquote, it now replaces Chevron deference. Uh, and what that'll mean for the, dis my concern is what it'll mean for the lower courts. Uh, it, I think Chevron, well, I don't believe it's that dramatic because, as I said, the court made a rule and it can unmake a rule. Uh, it's still, it's now turning the lower courts free to challenge any agency action they don't like and to imply the second level of deference, which is not in any ways mandatory, may not get us out of the problem. And we may find out that de novo review becomes even as more important mm -hmm. and, and frustrating, actually, to the judicial system. They are, after all, um, about 600 and some federal district judges, and there are some 11,000 administrative judges of some nature. Uh, so 
it's not possible to think that all of those cases could come to the Supreme Court, yeah. to the federal courts in, in, in any sensible way. There's also a question of expertise, right? The, the original Chevron deference uh, was based on the notion that uh, a specialized agency like the Food and Drug Administration would have much more substantive knowledge about the case before it than a court would. Uh, and that was another reason why uh, the judges, the courts, well, should defer to the agencies. Right. That's a, such an important point, and, and I know you're, you're involved with the thoughts about agency expertise, as am I. Um, yes, it was a respect for the role of the agency, the fact that agencies were there because they were experts, and they were appointed for that reason. And that's why you wanted to have people tell you what they knew. Mm -hmm. You didn't want someone to tell you what you wanted to hear. Yeah. If you were even the president, always, you wanted to get the right answer. Yeah. And expertise has provided that. And Chevron respected expertise. To some extent, the Skidmore alternative, you have to be persuaded by it. It, it still re intends to respect it. And Robert Jackson knew more about politics. He was, after all, FDR's attorney general and knew, knew all the agent, New Deal agencies and how they came along, so he respected them too. But um, whether or not the respect remains, Frank, is to me the, <laughs> the overarching mm -hmm. question. And mm -hmm. I don't think the court, frankly, shows much respect to yeah. the agencies anymore. Just to make this concrete, the original Chevron deference had to do with their, their controls over emissions uh, from, let's say, a petrochemical plant. And the question was, do you do you regulate it by the facility as a whole, the whole factory, or a specific machine within the factory? Yes. And that's something... Smokestacks. Right. And that's something that a court doesn't have any particular knowledge about, whether machines or the whole factory are really the relevant right. unit. The, you know, it, it, <clears throat> it was such an interesting case. It was, by the way, it was Ann Gorsuch's case when she was head of the EPA under Reagan, but she subsequently was removed. Uh, and, of course, she's the uh, mother of our famous judge now, uh, who's uh, Justice Gors Gorsuch, who wrote very happily in this, in this area. Um, but, right, it was, you know, a policy decision. Mm -hmm. and, and I think they understood, look, let's not get into this arena because, you know, maybe we're right, maybe we're, we're not experts. Mm -hmm. They're experts. So it was a, a form of respect. Mm -hmm. And when you take it away or you water it down, <coughs> uh, the respect kind of gets lost a little bit, and, and I don't think that's wise. Um, I think it's wise to appoint people who know what they're doing, uh, who have integrity, by the way, who mm -hmm. will tell you what the actual answer should be, the real answer, the true answer, and we'll see how that goes. Um, but let me just shift to a second case, which I think makes the point even um, more importantly than the, on this expertise thing than, than the first one. And that, that's a case called Jarchese versus SEC. Um, it's probably much more important ultimately to the administrative state than, than the um, Loper-Bright case because that we'll work our way through those problems and their judicial review problems. But Jarchese is different. Jarchese um, was given a civil penalty by the uh, SEC under a statute which had recently been amended during the Dodd-Frank uh, amendment period to say you could bring a case against uh, someone for a civil penalty either in the court, in the federal courts, or in, by, in the agency through the administrative law judge. Uh, before that, the uh, SEC only had the power to go to the federal court. So the Congress granted this additional power, which is similar to a lot of powers of agencies. And the case comes up, and the issue, one issue that they took the case on, uh, the Fifth Circuit, by the way, had several issues. They didn't resolve all of them, and that's a, a subsequent problem that's going to have to be dealt with. A case came from the Fifth Circuit, which is notorious now for, um, I would say, if you're talking about ending the administrative state, mm -hmm. that's the lead circuit. And this is a really conservative uh, circuit, uh, Texas, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi. Right. It yeah. used to be the great circuit for the civil rights period, as, as I've mentioned to you before. When, when I was a dean at 
Tulane years ago, Judge uh, John Minor Wisdom was the uh, really the patron saint of, of the Fifth Circuit, and he did more than any other judge to help integrate the South in those tough periods. Uh, he and John Brown and uh, Elbert Tuttle in Atlanta, those are famous judges. Well, it's not the same crowd anymore, yeah. for sure. It's really right wing now. And yeah, yeah, and it's true believers, and everyone is, is the justice the judges are working harder and harder to sort of prove how tough they are on the on the government. Uh, so Jarkesi says, look, we know that you now can go to the district, or either the district court or the uh, administrative law judge, but the thing you can't do, what about the Seventh Amendment, which is a right to jury trial? Now this, case, th this argument hadn't been made seriously in a long time. There are some cases, but not a lot. So the right to jury trial says, at common law, you have to have the right to a jury, at common law. And um, then the question became, well, is this a, a common law uh, complaint uh, or not? And so there is a big thing about whether um, it's a public law right or a common law right, and they work through all of that. And they end up saying, look, the Seventh Amendment applies here, therefore you cannot decide a case because administrative law judges can't have juries mm -hmm. by definition, they're administrative agencies. Uh, you must go to the federal court instead. They eliminated the power Congress had recently given them. Congress had recently given them explicitly the power to decide these cases and they took it away. Um, the case that went Further than that, however, it also implied that anything to do with a civil penalty, which is a money penalty imposed by an agency, is a questionable activity. Um, there is a case still that they distinguished um, involving, it's called Atlas Roofing, Atlas Roofing, which allowed OSHA, um, Occupational Safety and Health Act, to provide a civil penalty in another, in a different kind of a setting. And they chipped away at it. Several, two of the justices felt it should be overruled too, which means then that not only is it a suited common law that you have to ask, or a public right, which is accepted from that, you also have to ask if it's a civil penalty versus an injunction um, or some other uh, equitable remedy which could still be permitted. Now, the Supreme Court didn't pull the, <laughs> pull the plug on the, all civil penalties. And I, it's interesting, we, um, I, I was, a piece of work that I had done in, with several of my colleagues, in, which was part of the ACUS uh, request, it was an elaborate study of all administrative adjudication done years ago, was cited by, in, in dissent by Justice Sotomayor. We concluded that there are 200 or more, 200 at least, 200 that. statutes that, she, that provide for civil penalties. So this is where the case gets, that's why I say it's more important than, than the Chevron demise case because 200 statutes provide for administrator, and often they don't have an alternative to go to court anyway, so, you'd, so there's no action. If you, if you end civil penalty powers by agencies, you deprive them the ability to regulate. Of yeah. enforcement. Mm -hmm. And without enforcement, what's, yeah. what do we have, right? Mm -hmm. uh, persuasion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Jackson notion? Persuasion? So 200 cases. Now, interesting, we, we wrote that article 20, oh, 1990s. So there may be many more than 200. It, it's, and the court didn't even address this problem mm -hmm. when they decided, and they're surely going to go after this Atlas Roofing case uh, because they, they, Justice Rob, Chief Justice said, 
You know, the single most important factor is that it's a civil penalty. Money damage is issued by the, by the uh, administrative agency, even though there's judicial review, obviously. Uh, that doesn't matter. So that's where it gets very hard. And um, I'm just thinking about um, the uh, further arguments that could be made, but uh, let's just leave that there in terms of it, the case itself. It's going to be problematic. They're going to have to clean up the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit took another issue. They said, well, administrative law judges are unconstitutional because they have, quote, four cause removal protection. And now we've been spending a lot of time, Frank, on the four cause problem, mm -hmm. you know, why you want administrative agents to, to have independence mm -hmm. and to, can only be removed for some cause. Mm -hmm. Cause not being, well, the president doesn't like you. Mm -hmm. Uh, this goes forever. Yeah, so just to explain, this is a way of depoliticizing these positions yes. by making it not just at the pre pleasure of the president. Exactly. But they have to rape somebody or, you know, murder somebody before they can be removed. Yeah, well, no, I, I don't have to go that far, but you can be <laughs> removed for, uh, you know, <clears throat> for doing things that are not appropriate, um, and um, but it has to be cause. Mm -hmm. And... Um, this goes back to the Humphreys executor case decided, by the way, if I may add this little point. Um, the Humphreys executor said that the chairman of the FTC couldn't be removed ex because he had a quota four cause statute, mm -hmm. unless by cause. And, and President uh, Roosevelt had removed him without saying anything about cause. And so then, of course, Humphrey dies. That's why it's Humphrey's executor. And his diligent executor brings a lawsuit to get his salary back. It was a very funny way it's set up. But this case was decided in um, 1935. And um, right in the middle of the transition from one court to another in the 30s. And Robert uh, Jackson in his memoirs says, you know, I was in, when I had to tell FDR uh, about this case, he really got angry because it's such a small thing and why the court would pick on it doesn't make any sense. Um, and um, it, in a way, it, Jackson said this was the one that really precipitated the, his desire to, to pack the court. Uh -huh. um, so, so that's a, just a by the by. Um, so now we get the notion of four cause removal is in jeopardy too that's that's come still to come frank but mm -hmm. but i think there'll be cases on that so well, just to put this in a broader context this uh is of a piece with schedule f i mean this uh part of project 2025 that will allow the president basically to remove anyone they want not for cause but simply because they don't like him or they think that uh their yes. politics is wrong, this sort of thing. Well, this is what, you know, we've been working on, um, and um, I think it's very important. Schedule F, I, I believe, um, is getting some uh, political awareness that it had probably didn't have before, but this is part of the Project 25 goals, um, which now uh, President, former President Trump is run, trying to run away from. And the goal is to replace policy-making officials in government with uh, make them at-will employees so that they'll do the orders of the president. And so for cause prevents that. And in order to back, and there, for cause is all out throughout government for good mm -hmm. reason. You want people who know something. You don't want people who are just appointed because they say, yes, sir, whatever you want, uh, we'll do it. Um, you know, this is like a, an outrageous limitation on mm -hmm. the expertise requirements. Mm -hmm. So we're di digging into that, and I hope that, um, you know, our work will, will mm -hmm. lead to some more reflection on the importance of it. I, I took recently just to f find out how many f statutes involving administrative officials have four-cause removal and we came up with 339 statutes. We mm -hmm. searched everything. I, I searched uh, Jennifer Salen, a very fine academic um, who's at, actually now at ACUS, <laughs> and I worked together, but she did a lot of the deep research, and we have determined this. 
There's 400 people. And there's a reason they have for cause. For example, the head of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, or the head of the census, or the head of the IRS, they have for cause removal for a very good reason, right? Mm -hmm. You can only imagine. I don't have to spell it out. Why? We want pe those people, we want to, ha to have information. What good did the BLS be if we couldn't trust its data? Yeah, well, just to make this very concrete, Donald Trump at one point in the campaign said, well, the unemployment rate, you know, is not uh, 3 or 4 percent. It's really 40 percent. And he just pulls this number out of the air. And uh, if he could actually control who runs the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you know, he could get a guy that would back him up on that, just like, uh, you know, he couldn't get somebody to back him up on that hurricane that he claimed was going to hit Alabama. Um, well, you know, yes and no. Um, remember that famous story where he had the, the Sharpie, Sharpie and he, he changed the route of the hurricane? And NASA officials, you know, were aghast. But they later had to apologize. Mm -hmm. they, the chairman or the chief of NASA said, look, he's really angry. So they actually apologized, you know, I guess to save their jobs, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know. But anyway, so that's right. This yeah. is such an example. Um, so that's the story of for cause. We want people in government to do what they're supposed to do, give you, if you're not just government, if you're in corporate life or any life, mm -hmm. you, you want people to tell you the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let me just, so go back, oh, when I said back to the future, let me just set yep. that up mm -hmm. a little bit with you again, because it's so much, it's so interesting. Um, 30s court was, this is why Jarchese and the Seventh Amendment are so important. In, in the 1930s, um, the, in England, it starts in England because the common law is always, you know, uh, under the Seventh Amendment, to determine what the common law was at the time of the Constitution, you have to go to English precedent because everyone followed English law. That's all we had, really. Mm -hmm. We didn't have law written down as much as the English did. So A. V. Dicey, who was this famous Oxford uh, Venerian professor, had written a book in the 30s called uh, "Worrying About." He calls it. It's called the Law of the Constitution, but it's he worries about what he calls administrative absolutism, and he was so worried that the British uh, version of the administrative state would take away your right to appear before a common law court and have your a jury decide your fate, that he called it absolutism. That theme, absolutism, Dicey's theme, was picked up in the United States at the time, in the 30s, by, by Roscoe Pound, the most famous academic of his time, a great figure in law, um, sociological jurisprudence, among other m major things that he did. But this one he stuck in his craw, and he liked Dicey's view, and he didn't like FDR for some reason at that point, or he had been a friend, but he was no longer. So he started and took the, Pound took the dicey proposition of absolutism and started, anyway. Now, guess Justice Gorsuch, in his concurrence in Jarchese, you have to read this if you really want to study someone. Gorsuch spends pages and pages on what the common law is. It's a, I might say it's it's really a sort of pedantic exercise, and I know more common law of England than you do. Um, but in the middle of it, he cites Pound, and he cites Pound uh, for an obvious reason. I think it's very revealing that Roscoe Pound reappears because Roscoe Pound is the one who came up with this notion, and administrative absolutism is what they are really fighting about, and they're not going to stop. So that's the 1930s court. That's the court before the switch in time. Um, now, who's making those arguments today? Um, a few years ago, I had, in fact, here at the Stanford Law School, I debated uh, Philip Hamburger, who's a fine professor at Columbia Law School, who had written a book about uh, the illegality of the administrative state. But it, from its beginning, it was wrong and illegal. And at the time, you know, people didn't really 
give him as much credit, I guess, or didn't. I, I certainly still don't, but to, I mean, to respect his views. But but I, and it was illegal on what basis? That it wasn't, of course, among, among others, it deprived you of the jury trial. It goes back to he spends all of his time, he, Hamburger, much like uh, Justice Gorsuch, spends his time on the common law of England mm -hmm. and buying the notion that only the common law can provide true justice. The jury of your peers and so forth, if it's a, a legal matter. <clears throat> so this. And, and just to clarify, that means that an administrative agency that wants to enforce a rule upon you would have to go through a jury trial in order to yes, do that? Yes, only if it's a legal question. A mm -hmm. civil penalty is a legal um, remedy. Mm -hmm. um, if it's have an, ask an injunction or a cease and desist order, those are, ec quote, equitable, and you don't have the right to a jury. So those theoretically could still be done, issued by... You, for example, you can issue licenses mm -hmm. if you're an agency. That that's not, a, and you know, if you deny someone a license, that's not a, a legal issue. That's mm -hmm. an equitable issue, okay. perhaps. So there's that division. You'd have to still make there'd be some powers, but the real power is, is enforcement, uh, mm -hmm. and civil penalties are how you force things. Of mm -hmm. course, junctions I would work the same way, mm -hmm. but they're less um, important in some ways. So that's where we where we are. Um, and but Hamburg, Professor Hamburger wasn't dissuaded by all by any criticism. A lot of which came from his own colleagues um, in the administrative law world. Uh, he went forward and um, pursued his dream and created something called the New Civil Liberties Alliance, which is the one. It's an an NGO which is bringing these cases. And getting a very nice hearing, and the judge, and that's why the pound, the citation to pound, I think, is so revealing because they love Roscoe Pound's view of the world mm -hmm. from the 1930s. So this is back to the future. This is Roscoe Pound lives again. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the old court, the old pre-reconstructed court lives again, and they're proud of it. They think the biggest mistake we ever made was the administrative state, and they think somehow we can fix it. I got to just do one thing. Um, it, it's, I must say, I think it's a very arrogant position of the Supreme Court, They're taking away things that were established and settled and starting again because you have this academic view of what the world is, this formalistic view of what the world, legal world should be. The one kind of, you know, you write law review articles about and, and you and this is what, but now we're actually deciding cases that affects people's lives and function. Um, Robert Jackson, there's a quote I, I can't resist reading for this point, and Robert Jackson, who knew so much about politics and law, we are not final because we are infallible, but we are infallible only because we are final. That's what he said the Supreme Court did. Well, this court is beginning to think more like they're infallible mm -hmm. than that they're final. Um, and I, I just really hope, I think there's some signs that maybe some of them will, uh, judicial modesty might return to mm -hmm. them a little bit. I hope so because... Uh, Justice Breyer left the court. He was a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. He understood, and he understood the administrative state. He mm -hmm. had worked in it, and he had the right approach. You have to look at the effect of a rule, mm -hmm. not just, you know, does it comply with original thinking or, or the common law? Uh, you need to look. It affects people. Yeah. And so the conservative complaint about judicial activism falls away the moment that the activism is being used in, I know, we don't in terms of uh, conservative causes. <clears throat> you, you know, the, um, the new Civil Liberties Alliance is really like the other side. The old, civ the old Civil Liberties Alliance was really uh, things like public citizen, which back in the 60s and 70s, you know, they said, look, well, let's make sure that people who are applying for government benefits have procedures, protections, um, they were worried about the little person, and now we're worrying about the large corporation, whether, whether or not they get procedural protections 
away from the state. Uh, that's new civil liberties versus uh -huh. old civil uh -huh. liberties. Um, it's something. And it reflects the larger change in our politics over that period of time. I hope not. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, not yet. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, Paul Verkyle, that's uh, that was really fascinating. And uh, this uh, story is not over. Uh, even after the coming November election, this is still going to be contested, I think, uh, as one of the big issues that divides the left and the right. So, um, but thank you for those explanations, and let's, you know, hope for the best as, as we go yeah. forward. Well, it's a pleasure to work with you, Frank, and to be part of your larger efforts, and uh, thank you for having me. Okay.